All right, so in this video, we are going to see our first major case where two-dimensional space and three-dimensional space differ when it comes to parameterized curves. And it's gonna come back to our old friend, the curvature, and our idea of a unit tangent and unit normal vector. Recall that in two-dimensional space, we had the idea of a parameterized curve that looks like this, and I mean, maybe more specifically, the idea that when we had such a parameterized curve, we could calculate a unit tangent vector, that was t, and a unit normal vector, u, at each point along the curve, right? So specifically, we would calculate t, which was just our x prime, our parameterized curve definition, capital X. It was x prime divided by the length of x prime would give us this unit tangent vector. And then the unit normal vector corresponded to a pi over 2 rotation counterclockwise. And so that gave us our unit tangent and unit normal vector. And of course, we saw a couple important facts that because it was a pi over 2 rotation, t and u were perpendicular to each other. They each had unit length, right? So they were each length 1. Uh, and then when it came time to calculate curvature, what an important fact that we used was that t prime was actually a scalar multiple of u. And in fact, curvature was defined to be that unique function that helped relate the two. So curvature had to do quite a bit with that scalar. But it meant that it was important that t prime was a multiple of u. All right. So let's see what happens in the three-dimensional case, right? So let's say we have a parameterized curve, capital X, in three-dimensional space, right? I'm sort of drawing that over here. Here's my curve in three-dimensional space. Uh, it is parameterized, and using its parameterization, we can still calculate a unit tangent vector, capital T. So specifically, we can still calculate capital T, and we can do this by taking by taking capital X prime and then dividing by the length of capital X prime. So exactly the same way that we did it in two-dimensional space, right? X prime will give us this velocity vector, and then when we divide by the speed, that will give us a vector of unit length, but is still running tangent to the curve. And so these unit tangent vectors will lie all along our curve in a tangent direction, right? And we can imagine calculating these at every point on the curve. Draw in one more for fun. Yeah, there we go. But what happens beyond that, right? Here's where we run into our first real hurdle. In two-dimensional space, right, by virtue of just being on the xy plane, we could talk about rotating our curve, or rotating our vector, in a way that made sense, right? If I said a pi over 2 rotation counterclockwise, we know what that means. In three-dimensional space, all of a sudden, this doesn't quite make sense, right? We can't talk about a pi over 2 rotation because there's too many different ways I can rotate. To be really precise, suppose I have a vector pointing in this direction. Should a pi over 2 rotation be a rotation in this direction? Should it be a rotation in this direction? Like, how does that, how do we make sense of that, right? So this is our first big hurdle, like we said. There's not a quick and easy way to define what our uh, normal vector should be. And in a certain sense, there shouldn't just be a single normal vector, right? We have our tangent vector, but there's a whole host of directions that are all perpendicular to this tangent direction, right? So there won't, what we'll see is that there won't just be one normal vector we will in fact be interested in two normal vectors, the so-called principal normal vector and then the binormal vector. Uh, and so let's see where those come from. So the key observation right, that we made last time, let me back up for a second, the key observation that we made last time was that t prime was a scalar multiple of u. And in particular, that t prime was completely perpendicular to t itself. Now, it turns out that will still be true in this case for the same reasons that it was true in the previous case, right? So because t is unit length, we'll see that t dot t prime is actually equal to 0, right? So we could explicitly calculate, and I'll sort of scooch down here a little bit. I'll actually also change my color. 
right? So we have t. It turns out, uh, it turns out, right? It turns out that the vector t is completely perpendicular to the vector t prime, which means that t prime is pointing in a normal direction or a perpendicular direction from t. So what we can do is we can actually take t prime, this vector that's pointing in a perpendicular direction, and then divide by its length to get a unit vector perpendicular to t. And that's exactly what we do. So the principal normal vector, right? So the principal normal vector, which we'll call capital P, is defined by, or is given by, p equals, and now it will be t prime, divided by the length of t prime. All right, and what we get now is a vector that is completely perpendicular to uh, t. All right, and so we can go back in here, and just like before, uh, right, this can be computed at every point on the curve. So really, p and t are both functions of time. I'm sort of suppressing that. I'll remind us again at the end of this. Um, but this is computed at each individual point along the curve. So at each point in time, we can compute a corresponding t and a corresponding p. Okay, we've got two directions, but there's still one direction or one dimension left to account for, right? So there are three principal uh, vectors i, j, k when we're talking about three-dimensional space. We really want three vectors to describe three-dimensional space. Uh, we have our tangent vector. We have one normal vector. We want another normal vector that's perpendicular to this normal vector. And that will be the so-called binormal, binormal vector. And so finally, uh, right, we can talk about the binormal vector and the binormal vector will be denoted with a capital B. And we actually have a very slick way to compute this, right? P and T are both unit length. And we're looking for a vector that's perpendicular to T and perpendicular to P that also has unit length. So from the last video, we realize that a cross product is a great thing to use here. If I take the cross product of t and p, I will get a new vector perpendicular to both of them and of length equal to 1. And so we'll do that here. This binormal vector b is simply given by computing t, uh, let me say, give it as a formula. So b equals t cross p. Right, and that will be a third vector perpendicular to each of the other two. Right, so, of course, on a board, it's a little hard to believe that these are all perpendicular. But sort of bear with me in that case. Right, so we're imagining that each of these are perpendicular to each other. So they all meet at right angles. Those are all right angles in there. And they all have unit length. Uh, and then, like I said before, I think it's worth repeating. Like I said before, these are all really functions of time. So when I write t and b and p, I should really be writing t of t, right? That's little t there. That's our parameter. So t of t, p of t, and b of t, right? These are vector-valued functions in their own right because every t that I plug in gives me a new corresponding tangent vector, principal normal vector and binormal vector. <laughs> Great. OK, so this is a summary of what we've seen. We have our unit tangent vector computed like this, our principal unit normal vector 
computed like this, and then our binormal vector computed like this. And just like our three big vectors, i, j, and k, notice that these three vectors are all perpendicular to each other. They're all of unit length. And taken together, they form a basis for R3. So this is called the Frenet orthonormal basis, or more commonly, when we list them in this order, T, P, B, they are called the Frenet frame, a frame being a basis that's just listed in a particular order. So this is the Frenet frame that runs along x of t. And we'll see that this becomes important to us going forward.